Nikhil, you know, uh, this is a unique partnership that uh, USA has developed, you know, where uh, you're partnering with an industry chamber, you're partnering with, uh, you know, private sector institutions like ICSI, WISH, you're partnering with uh, knowledge repository institutions like World Bank. So Millennium Balance is a unique uh, platform, you know, bringing in all these partnerships. So how do you see that USA leverages uh, such partnership programs to address the gaps and challenges for service delivery at the last month? Great, thanks, Edith, and thanks for uh, having me on the panel. Um, USAID is is absolutely viewing uh, partnership as uh, as a core tenant that we attempt to strive uh, towards. Um, in fact, there's a common acronym, and as people may or may not know, we love acronyms at USAID and the U.S. government. Uh, there's a common acronym that we now use, which is STIP, S T I P, which stands for Science, Technology, Innovation, and Partnership. And as my colleague recently said, it's a good thing it's not SPIT, although that, that works as well. Or it's also a good thing it's not PIST, which could have worked as well. But in reality, there's a reason why partnership is at the end of that. STIP, Science, Technology, Innovation Partnership. Because science, technology, innovation, as we've been talking about for the last two and a half days, are critical to uh, sort of address these development challenges. But partnership, beyond science, technology, and innovation, partnership is at the foundation of all of that. And we believe that beyond sort of platforms like the Millennium Alliance, each of our sector focus areas at USAID India, and in fact, even in USAID Washington, are now starting to look at partnership as modus operandi. You must be looking through the partnership lens. And a, a, another mission director from another country recently told me, he said, in our programs, if we are looking for partners and we can't find a partner for our program, that might mean there's a problem with our program. And so we really are looking at partnership as sort of the, the way to move forward. So my next question is to Bhavna. Bhavna, as a young entrepreneur, what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs who are looking to start their own business? What has been some of the key learnings of the World Bank from executing multi-partner programs in various geographies? Are the challenges faced in India similar to those that you face in other geographies as well? And how do we mitigate such challenges using you know, the knowledge that World Bank has developed by implementing programs like development marketplace for separate years. Thanks, and thanks for having uh, me on this panel. I just want to begin uh, by saying, I think just as all the uh, fellow panelists mentioned, I think the strength of Millennium Alliance and we're very proud partners as, as, as the knowledge partners is really pretty the collective, collective to be able to leverage each other's strengths. And I think from that perspective, it's been about a year since we joined Millennium Alliance, and, and I think we see a huge potential and opportunity to bring not just the global experience that the World Bank has in this space, but also to take the India's experience, which is today seen as very, very valuable to the rest of the world. So our global experience, and, and, and responding to your specific question on what is it that we see similar to what we are doing in India to promote social entrepreneurial innovations, I think what World Bank really sees as two or three critical areas where uh, we think platforms like Millennium Alliance are very well placed to this. First, we see that uh, you know, with all the passion, with all the energy, the innovations that come in, what's critical is capacity building support to help them demonstrate, deliver, and scale up. Our entire emphasis has been on scaling up for impact. And, and, and we have to admit that you know, our development marketplace program, which is, which is one of the unique global programs which crowdsources innovative ideas, and we have almost about 1,200 pro projects that we have funded globally, you know, we were initially in a phase of fund and forget. You, you crowdsource, you, you kind of award them, and then they're pretty much unknown. And very soon we realized that that's not the way to go. We actually have to provide quite systematically the capacity building support. And our entire development marketplace program in India over the last four years is being premised on the fact that there is a lot of learning on the ground which we must take out, which we must distill, and be able to share it with the other innovators, with the other people who are trying to develop these business models. So I'll talk about three specific things which we have seen, and I think. Uh, uh, we do find that a lot of lot of uh, innovators and social entrepreneurs with whom we are working uh, have seen the value of capacity building, and they, they routinely kind of come back and say that's the kind of support we really need to to help us do that. 
the three specific areas where we find uh, there, is, there is quite a huge demand is one is in terms of just, just looking at the business model and the organizations as they are scaling up. And, and we have right now just done a study of mapping 6,000 sort of business models. And there's a lot of cross-learning, a lot of cross-learning to be able to say, even with the technology innovation, how do you use that as an enabler, but then at the end of the day, put around the business model, which can actually help you to scale up and commercialize. So that's, that's one area to understand the business model. Second important thing that, that we find is, you know, how do you do the M&E and the impact assessment? Because a lot of time, uh, when you go out and try and raise, you know, uh, 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 resources for these projects, we always talk about social impact. And so therefore, very early on to be able to uh, show and demonstrate and to capture what is your social impact and how do you do the M&E, actually can be a very strong way for you to then leverage funding for the market. And that's again an area where we find more and more there is an increasing demand to say, how can we build the capacities of social entrepreneurs in that space? And the third point that I want to mention is that entire value chain in terms of the business that the social entrepreneurs do. We've realized that there are different pieces that different social entrepreneurs need. And what we have done is we've actually launched the first set of e-learning platform which really in some sense give you A to Z of what you need to do when you're trying to do a social business. And, and this is a program which we've launched and we find there is a huge demand from, from the social entrepreneurs to take on this e-learning course around developing business models, developing impact models to particularly serve the bottom of the world. So my next question would be to Mr. Anil Sinha. Uh, sir, uh, you know, Having so much diverse experience, you know, having spent uh, over 30 years in this space, how do you see that the MA as an is an uh, becomes an enabling platform to bring diverse partners together and uh, to cohesively work together for a common end? Thank you. Firstly, it's it's a great honor for me to be chairing the strategic advisory board of the enterprise because I do think it's a unique platform of partnership. If I can answer this question in two parts, partnership within MA, so MA as a partnership platform, and MA brokering partnerships outside with other stakeholders for the common group. On the first, we really have to show to partners that being part of a collective platform, the whole is much larger than some of its parts. In other words, if any of these partners were doing their individual programs, and even if you add it up, would not get what MA provides as a collective platform. <coughs> Unless you can show that, you don't really make the case for partnership. And the other aspect is common objectives. People come together, I think MA has done tremendously in getting such a strong uh, partnership platform going, but you can only cement a partnership if you have common objectives and common deliverance. And you do get people with the right intent, and all our partners are coming in with excellent intent because the the problem is so large. This is the problem that you can't solve without partnerships, which is delivering services to the EOP, uh, to our business. That's basically the intention. And the problem you can't do, nobody can do this in the future. You need that partnership. But nevertheless, as we know, even in a marriage, you must have that common good established up front. And that's what we try to do as part of the NA is to say, look, here are the common deliverables so that everyone joins in that. I, I think the other uniqueness is, is Pinky itself. Because it is an industry body, it's considered neutral, so it's, it's a convenient organization for other partners to join. And it not only is it convenient, but I think it has a tremendous leverage with the kind of membership it has. It is the leading private sector organization in India. Mr. Saxena has the innovation part of that. Uh, so that is the other uniqueness. If it was I as an individual consulting company saying, I've got a platform, come and join me, it would not happen. So that's the other part of the partnership. But then, Millennium Alliance can be much more than that. If one looks at the problem we're trying to solve, and they can't do this alone either. So partnering, firstly, with the government. You can't ignore the government, as Mr. Saxena is saying, when you're dealing with the Space. 
and uh, for the first time this round, we're going to have one criteria for, for, for judging, which will be additional to what we've had in the past, is how are you leveraging, how are you part of a government program? Uh, you know, we've got the other criteria, uh, what's the impact, what's your financial sustainability, what's your team, all that is there that you would have. But this is an additional space, and that partnership helping enterprises get into partnerships with government, and MA also getting into partnership from the government is like the next partnership phase, I think, that we see going forward. And the other is, MA is a freedom platform. We identify social enterprises, nurture them, but we can't take them to scale ourselves. So how do we become a freedom platform for other commercial investors to take the growth to the next level? We have examples of two brilliant social enterprises that have done exactly that, uh, where we've been a catalyst, but they've gone on to other parts. Uh, so, for example, we're talking about partnership with India Impact Investors Council, so that we become a feeder platform to them and, and to banks, uh, so they can take it to the next level. Grant is critical up to a certain level, but clearly as they grow, they will need working capital, they will need equity. So we need to be that feeder platform to take it to the next level, and for that we need to have partnerships. And my next question would be, one of our uh, social enterprises uh, results, you know, because you are really on working on the ground, so being a private sector veteran, Mr. Menon, you know, you were working with GE for many, many years and then jumped into the social entrepreneurship space and you have now worked with both central and state governments. What is your opinion on the effectiveness of delivery of last mile solutions when compared with the private and public sector? So when you compare the two, what is your opinion? Which channels work best? Or is it a, you know, a manifestation of all? Thank you, Indy. Uh, at when we started, there was a, we found a problem. We, um, we knew that there is a problem of not having access to clean and safe water in India. So we, we, we wanted to solve it, solve the problem that existed uh, with the uh, you know with the environment there. That means people are there, poor people, they don't have access to safe water. Somebody has to give safe water. So we saw it as a need as well as an opportunity, and that is how we started. And of course, as we went along, we found that we were, uh, you know, something like a social enterprise, uh, great thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, we always believed uh, that in terms of performance or in terms of matrix uh, that you have to deliver, or in terms of financial returns or in terms of the challenges and how successes are measured, there is uh, not much of a difference in the, you know, in the ultimate uh, plans between a social enterprise and a normal enterprise as well. Coming to this question, okay, I would like to maybe uh, set up a small context to the uh, last mile delivery solutions uh, in social enterprise, or oh, sorry, in, uh, to the people, uh, and the difference between how a private and a public sector does it. Uh, whenever a LM, uh, LMP or a last mile delivery things comes, what comes to the mind? So I would just like to segregate of what we are doing and what the last night and the solutions are there which exist across the entire spectrum of requirements that is there and you are seeing more and more of that. So first thing that obviously comes maybe a e-commerce and the logistics uh, like a flip card and the people who want to bridge the gap between e-commerce and the last night delivery that it is a um, whatever there is a delivery or there is a uh, Aramco and, and so many other new uh, companies that have come up. What I understand is that there are more than 400 companies in the uh, LMD space in the e-commerce itself which has raised more than 400 million dollars over the past few years. So that is one aspect of it. Second, of course, we all know or what we are more aware of is the uh, inclusive payment space that we all know and which started with the MFIs. How you are covering the last mile delivery of giving, uh, giving or financially including all those people. So whether it is an Aadhaar uh, or the recent payment schemes that have come up, Paytm and all, and the APIs that are being included. So that's sort of a big set of, and, and a very important thing of uh, last mile delivery services. There are so many others which all of us know, like we might be knowing, like the Swiggies for the uh, food delivery. So I just wanted to mention them. There, there's a whole set of uh, uh, LMD services that exist. But and I, I said that just to differentiate what we do at the 
last night delivery service and that you know so it is more of providing what we do is providing safe and clean water for the people so like let me say it's a it's a water or it's a sanitation so they come under you know asset based last minute delivery services as compared to the amalgamation that we are seeing today this is a diff entirely different business class of the amalgamation between let me say or the intersection of uh, uh, telecom and internet and smartphones what we do is a bit different that you have to build assets on the ground to provide the safe water and drinking water to people so it's it's in it's in a different class you know uh, so uh, so that's it and in this class of course you know scale comes okay but it is a brick and mortar business and uh, you know so uh, the private sector like us uh, uh, brings in innovative business models Okay, in this and most social sectors are somehow, you know, involved with a service that the government has to do or would have done or they do. So it is it is concerned with the people that you are delivering service to. So there is an element or there is an important element of government as well in this. Fine. So what the private sector can bring in is is innovation, is professionalism, is a good bandwidth of. Good people, corporate governance, and things like that. So these are the important metrics, and you know, metrics of performance. These are the important things which private uh, uh, people can get. In. But you know, what exists for the social enterprise is a huge infrastructure, logistics, and bandwidth that has already been created by the government, despite of what we speak of lack of infrastructure. But yet, if you go to the grounds, there is a huge thing that has already done. So what the private sector does really you know, uh, uh, capitalize is to use the uh, public infrastructure and anything as we have, you know, over several sessions with you this business. If you really need scale up in this business, if you really, really need scale up in social business, the public sector or the government has to get involved because that is where uh, the money is and uh, that is where the buy in has to come because if you don't do social, if, if you don't have that, uh, not just the you know, forget the commercial things like the search pricing problems that we are seeing in Delhi now, but even for important things like social sector, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So, the private sector brings in professionals, the public sector or the government, I, I would mean the public as a government that is, you know, they bring in uh, the infrastructure and the mine and the capital to do to a big extent of that. And uh, then, you know, there are the multilateral and bilateral and DFIs who play a very big role in you know in as as Anil said and as all of us have mentioned you know seeding this up and uh, you know bringing this uh, from a paper stage from a paper stage to a pilot and to an execution stage from where it can be where it can be scaled up and then there are of course the chambers of commerce like FIKI who do a very very vital role of you know creating the platform for delivering or making a platform on which all these things can be amalgamated together. So if you ask me, you know, if you ask me, uh, let me say a, a partnership like the Millennium Alliance, of which I have I am an awardee and which we serve a very, very uh, important purpose. But uh, you know, a, a partnership uh, like uh, the Millennium Alliance, which includes the private sector, the public sector, uh, the multilateral agencies, and the DFIs, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's a very, very important plan. Now, I, I myself had to, uh, you know, uh, bring a model to a big success in India, and then also, you know, I, I, it works as a business as well. So you need to diversify products, geographies, and also be, and, and the problem that we say, just to one more minute, if I have, uh, to replicate a successful model into a very like Africa. Okay, what drinking water is a huge issue there as well, and it was the Millennium Alliance uh, platform of Fiki, uh, the World Bank, DFID. Other agencies, USA, uh, TDB, all these, which created this platform, which could help me duplicate the successful model in Africa. So we can elaborate more, but this is a very, very important partnership, and and that is one of the very, very important ways to scale up the business. So our next question is to Revati, coming from Educate Girls, you know, and uh, providing solutions at the last mile in the education sector. What have been your key challenges, you know, for service delivery and providing the solution at the last mile? Thanks, uh, First of all, I'm extremely uh, honored to be on this uh, esteemed panel. 
Uh, well, uh, from a non-profit organization point of view, uh, you know, where we are working on women child education, I think the biggest challenge uh, that we face is, you know, having, you know, having to thrive on partnerships. I think we blossom and we thrive on partnerships because we work closely with the government. So given our program model, uh, you know, we work with the government, within the government school, so we do not build separate schools. We work within the government system, within the government funding. So I think for us, partnerships, uh, you know, thriving with partnerships, like I said, is one of the biggest challenges in terms of government. Because we want to ensure that we do not do any parallel delivery. We do not want to get into a space where we are trying to prove that we are doing a better job than the government. But we want to complement what the government is already doing. And I think getting into that space with the government requires a lot of collaboration and getting them on our side. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have uh, that we face with the government. And we have been present in Rajasthan for over eight years now, and gradually expand beyond Rajasthan to Madhya Pradesh this year. And uh, in the next three years, we also move to UP and Bihar. So having forayed outside of Rajasthan for the first time in UP this year, we realize how important our collaboration with the government is. Uh, you know, having said that, in the last eight years, being present in Rajasthan. Uh, you know, we have had the government kind of uh, appreciate our work and kind of, you know, appreciate our work in terms of adopting certain practices that we have implemented. Uh, just to give you a few examples, for example, in terms of the learning curriculum, the government has actually, uh, you know, adopted the learning curriculum, which is an acti activity based pedagogy that we have implemented in schools. Secondly, we have a life skill training that we have done for uh, the lawless and girls that we work with. So, I mean, uh, in terms of partnerships, I think. Clearly, government is the first and foremost, and also for a, a non-profit working on education, from an outreach perspective, uh, you know, our collaboration with the government is a must when we look at expansion going forward. Secondly, I think the biggest challenge for all for us is you know working with the community members. Uh, why I say so is because you know our community members and volunteers are our eyes and ears on the field, and uh, we work with the community leaders. The uh, you know, the seniors, the gram panchayas, and everybody across the community to ensure that they kind of, you know, they are on our side and they also understand how important it is to educate the whole child. Uh, we work in the remotest and the hardest to reach geographies and, uh, you know, it's a highly paternalistic society in Rajasthan. We work out of Rajasthan currently and uh, in these societies, a goat is a natural and a bird is a livelihood. So that is the kind of a mindset. So it's not only about enrolling a girl into school, but it's also about bringing about that mindset change. And when we have worked with uh, you know the community over the last eight years, we see that change. Uh, that's going to take time. I think it's more of a behavioral aspect, which is going to take time. But I think uh, in terms of challenge, this is the, one of the biggest challenges that we face. Also, from a community perspective, we work with community volunteers. We call them Team Barika. And they are boys and girls who are, uh, you know, in the age group of 15, uh, 18 to 25. And uh, because uh, we want it to be a movement from the community itself, uh, we want the community to start talking about the cause of girl education. For us, that is another very, very big challenge on the ground. So in terms of partnership, like I said, of course, the government and the community. And lastly, because we are a grant-funded organization, our donors and partners, you know, and our collaboration with them is a must. And it's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, over the years, we have had some very good names on our, you know, uh, funders and partners list. But however, we do not look at, you know, partnerships only from a funding perspective. I think as an organization, we are uh, somebody who want to learn and grow each day. And uh, because of which we look at uh, organization capacity building as a very, very important element. So if we look at partnerships, if we look at uh, you know donors coming on board, we look at organization capacity as well as a very very important initiative.